In Washington, our federal lawmakers are getting ready for a shakeup in the Congress. Republicans will have control of the House after gains during the midterms, but they fell short on their push to grab a hold of the Senate. That means chambers split across party lines and a strong possibility of partisan gridlock. It's something former U.S. Senator for New Mexico Jeff Bingaman knows a lot about. Mr. Bingaman has a new book called Breakdown, Lessons for a Congress in Crisis. And in it, he talks about the growing polarization in Washington and across the country. Here's senior producer Lou DeVizio. I'm privileged to be joined today by one of New Mexico's foremost politicians in recent history, serving four years as New Mexico Attorney General, followed by three decades, 30 years in the U.S. Senate, including five as chair of the Senate Energy Committee. Senator Jeff Bingaman, thank you so much for being here. Nice to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, you have a new book out now, and it's about as timely as you can get after the midterm elections. Uh, from a partisan standpoint, things tightening up in Washington. It's called Breakdowns, Lessons Learned for a Congress in Crisis. What is it about this moment that makes the message of this book so relevant right now? Well, I think what makes it relevant is, uh, first of all, uh, you've got a divided government again in Washington. Uh, we're, the House will be controlled by Republicans uh, in the new Congress. It begins in January. And of course, uh, the Democrats will continue to control the Senate and the White House. Uh, so in the past, that's, that's not been a good recipe for making progress. And I, I fear that uh, this time it will not be a good recipe either for making progress. And uh, I try to point out in the book some of the, some of the things that went wrong during the time I was there that in my view went wrong that, that uh, I think we'll see revisited and uh, probably repeated uh, in the next Congress. Now, a theme of the book is hyperpolarization. It's something we see around the country right now in the public, but also represented in Congress. It, what do you think has contributed to that? Well, I think, of course, the Congress uh, reflects what's going on in the country. But uh, uh, I think uh, in addition to that, members of Congress uh, uh, face uh, a series of obstacles or impediments to, to doing the, the public good or, or serving the public interest. And, uh, and I think those have all gotten worse. Uh, the special interests have a bigger voice in what happens in Washington than they used to have. Uh, the pressure to toe the party line and to stick with your, your party and not, not do anything that would disagree with with your party leadership that that pressure is greater than it ever was uh, the pressure to do what the polls say uh, we we now have the ability to essentially poll any segment of the population to find out what they think on a subject and and there's pressure on politicians to do what the polls say and then of course a lot of people come to congress with a lot of ideology uh, and, and I think that gets in the way of practical solutions to problems. And frankly, the media has become uh, a uh, significant factor in reinforcing the polarization. Now, when you see how polarization is portrayed from the media, when you're scrolling through social media, do you think that, that maybe it's, the public isn't quite as divided as it seems to be? Are there, I mean, are there a majority of people that just want things done? I think the a majority wants, wants to tone down the drama and, and the conflict and, and work on the problems that affect them. Uh, economic problems, uh, they're, they're worried about inflation, obviously, and uh, all of us are worried about inflation. They're, they're worried about uh, the future prospect of a possible recession and whether that's actually going to happen or not. Uh, and they've got other concerns. They're trying to raise a family and, and deal with the real life problems that people encounter. So uh, I think most people are in that category. Mo most people are not extreme in their politics. They, they are more interested in the results and whether or not Washington, people in Washington are work, working for them as they see it. Now you recently wrote an op-ed published by The Hill 
uh, where you talk about some of the themes in your book, like we've talked about polarization, gridlock, and Congress, but more spe specifically, you frame it through the lens of climate change legislation. This is something that you've dedicated a great portion of your career to, but before we get into the legislative issues that are surrounding climate action, I want to hammer down why, in your mind, you think it's such a vital issue for everyone, particularly in New Mexico. Well, I think that anybody who uh, pays attention uh, knows that uh, that extreme weather uh, events are more frequent now than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and uh, and the scientists, uh, I think, all almost uniformly at this point, maybe uh, maybe uniformly, uh, tell us that this is resulting from the warming of the climate. And that, of course, is, is being caused to a substantial extent by uh, human activity, uh, the use of fossil fuels, uh, and, and the enormous amounts of greenhouse gases that we're putting into the atmosphere. So, so it's, a, it's an issue that's, you know, it's going to be with us, frankly, for the next umpteen decades. It's not one that you can just sort of fix and then go on to some other problem. Uh, but uh, we need to be responsible to the extent we can, and uh, we've done very little so far. We, we need to do much more to come to grips with the problem. Now, in that op-ed, um, you detailed a timeline of, of climate action, including a quote from President George H.W. Bush, of course a Republican in 1992, promising that the U.S. would, quote, be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Have we failed in that mission? Well, I think we definitely have in recent years. I think uh, President Obama tried very hard to, to fulfill that role uh, with the Paris Accords that, that he championed and, and uh, helped persuade people to sign up to and sign the U.S. up to. But then, of course, that was uh, repudiated by uh, President Trump, and so we We've been off again, on again, and, and we don't seem to have a bipartisan consensus uh, that, uh, that the federal government needs to act responsibly to deal with the issue. So uh, it's unfortunate, we, we, you know, the, the Senate and, and the Congress passed a, an important piece of legislation to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, just in September. And, uh, and I compliment them for that, but it's not enough. I think everyone there knows it's not enough. And unfortunately, they passed it without any Republican support, uh, which, is, which is too bad uh, that, that they can't get Republicans to sign on uh, to some of these initiatives to try to begin dealing with the problem. I want to get to both of those things, actually, the Inflation Reduction Act and <clears throat> this lack of Republican support, that quote that I mentioned from uh, George H.W. Bush, that's probably not the rhetoric that you're gonna hear from Republican lawmakers in 2022. No, I, I agree. Uh, there's there are very few that are now uh, uh, reflecting that attitude that we need to be uh, the leader in the world in, in dealing with uh, climate change and maintaining the environment. What pushed that seemingly ideological shift in the Republican Party away from even acknowledging environmental issues to a large well, extent? Well, I think, unfortunately, and I talk about this uh, fairly extensively in the book, uh, I think special interests did an excellent job of, uh, first, of, of casting doubt on the science, uh, trying to persuade people that, you know, this may or may not be happening, and if it is happening, pe uh, in human activity may or may not be the cause. Uh, so so the, that general doubt, I think, was, was uh, promoted. And, and, then, uh, and then in 2009-2010, in, in that period, when the Tea Party was coming to, to power and, and was, was flexing their muscles, uh, I think they were persuaded by special interests to a large extent and politicians. They were persuaded that this was an overreach by the federal government. The federal government had no business in de trying to deal with this problem. And so, uh, so we uh, basically uh, lost our best opportunity uh, to, to deal with it right then. And, and uh, ever since, it's, it's sort of become uh, 
uh, Republican Party orthodoxy to to believe that uh, this is not something the federal government should take bold action to deal with, and and that's that may explain why we could not get a single Republican to support the legislation that was contained in the Inflation Reduction Act that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, you mentioned earlier the Inflation Reduction Act, and that was a milestone achievement for Congress while these lawmakers are contemplating everything you just brought up. As someone who's been involved in legislative negotiations, who deserves some credit for getting this package through with so much opposition, even within some of the moderate wing of the Democratic Party? Well, I, I think uh, Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader there in the Senate, deserves much of the credit. He, he negotiated this with Joe Manchin from West Virginia, and, uh, and Joe deserves some credit as well. Uh, but I, th I, I think Chuck was the one who would not give up on the idea that we can pass something here with, with 50 Democratic senators. Uh, and uh, and uh, he, he just pursued it doggedly there for, uh, for weeks and, and eventually got something agreed to and got it passed. Now, earlier we talked about, and throughout this whole conversation, hyperpolarization. But when you see the level of gridlock that we have, partly because of the filibuster, and we kind of talked about this before, but is there a disconnect between the gridlock and the partisanship that we see in Congress and the American public as a whole? Well, I think there is. As I indicated before, I, I think most people in, in the country are not as, as polarized and politicized as the people they send to Washington. Uh, I think some of the extreme elements, particularly on the Republican side, I think in, you know, the, they, they, uh, they are very demanding of the people that they send to Washington. And, uh, and accordingly, you've got people serving in the House and serving in the Senate who, uh, who feel under great pressure to reflect those extreme positions. And uh, that's, that's unfortunate. I, I think, you know, things like, uh, uh, rank choice voting, which is now being adopted in, you know, we have it in Santa Fe. I think they've adopted it in Alaska and various states are, are doing that. I think that would help a lot because it, it essentially makes you, as a member of Congress or as a candidate, it makes you uh, worry about uh, what does the entire group that could vote for me, uh, what do they prefer? You know, I'm, if, if you take too extreme a position, uh, you're not going to do well in a ranked choice voting kind of a, uh, a setup. So, so th there are some ideas out there for, for reducing this polarization, reducing this extremism. Senator Jeff Bingaman, thank you so much for joining and, us. Thank you.